One of the almost never negligible types of stress in mech design together with torsion is bending. We find it in applications with both static and cyclic loads, and it's present in most of the mechanical components that are studied in a Mech 1 course, like springs, screws, shafts, and welding. In this video, we will look at the normal stress equation for bending and the associated equations to calculate bending displacements. This also includes singularity functions. Let's start with a simple beam that is subjected to what we define a positive moment. If we look at the top and bottom of the beam, we notice that the top is under compression and the bottom is under tension. If we look at the deformed beam under an exaggerated deformation, we can see that there's one plane that has not been stretched or compressed, and that plane is what we call the neutral axis. The radius of curvature of a deformed beam is the radius from the center to that neutral axis. The neutral axis will serve as a point of reference for the distances in the y direction. The distance from the center of the radius of curvature to the plane that is found in compression would therefore be rho minus y. The strain for the length that is compressed at the top would be the change of length over the original length. The compressed length would be the length of an arc with angle theta and radius rho minus y. Remember that arc lengths can be calculated by multiplying the angle in radians times the radius. The original length L0 is the distance from A to B, either in the undeformed or the deformed beam. So if we're looking at the deformed beam, it would also be the length of the arc for the radius that goes up to the neutral axis, meaning rho. Thetas cancel out and rho's cancel out in the numerator, giving us a strain of minus y over rho. This strain expression is true for any value of y, and I know that the maximum strain would be found for the largest distance from the neutral axis, which we usually call c. Therefore, the maximum strain is minus c over rho, and solving for rho in the maximum strain equation and substituting it in the strain equation, we see that the strain for any value of y is equal to y over c times the maximum strain. If I multiply this expression by the elastic modulus, I find that the stress is equal to y over c times the maximum stress. Let's perform a cut on this beam, which can be any beam of a constant cross-section area, and let's take a look at a zoomed-in version of the side view. Since I know that the point of reference for y is the neutral axis, I know that at y equal to 0, I will find the neutral axis. Since the neutral axis is not being compressed or stretched, I know that the strain is 0, and therefore the stress is also 0. As I move away from the neutral axis, meaning y is no longer 0, the stress increases linearly. And I know that for a positive moment, the top portion will be under compression and the bottom will be under tension. If I look at an infinitesimal area that is located at the cut, I would see that that small area is subjected to a force df. If I multiply that force df by the distance to the neutral axis y, I would find the moment for that infinitesimal area. And notice that the direction of df is negative. If I add up all of these infinitesimal moments, which means doing a surface integral or an integral over the area, I would find the total moment m. Since the stress is force over area, I can substitute df, and since sigma is a function of y, I need to substitute it to explicitly show that. By taking out the constant and solving for sigma max, I find an expression that allows me to calculate the maximum normal stress due to bending in terms of the moment, the distance to the neutral axis, and what we call the second moment of area. The second moment of area is similar to what we covered in the previous video, link below. Except this time we're using Cartesian coordinates instead of polar coordinates. Many of the cross-section areas of beams, even the more complex ones, can result from putting rectangles together. So let's find the second moment of area of a simple rectangle with base B and height H as an example. If I want the second moment of area about the centroid, or the neutral axis, I would substitute my area integral as two integrals, one for x and one for y, where the limits of x are 0 to b and the limits for y minus h over 2 to h over 2. Notice that all I'm doing here is rewriting the infinitesimal area dA as a dx times dy and using integration limits that will cover the whole area. The integral of dx is x evaluated between 0 and b, which is just a constant b outside of the integral. The integral of y squared is y cubed over 3 evaluated between minus h over 2 and h over 2. This yields 1 over 12 times b times h cubed. Notice that this expression is different if I'm trying to find the second moment of area with respect to the bottom or the top of the rectangle. The integral limits for y would go from 0 to h, which would change the evaluation, and yield 1 over 3 times b times h cubed. So always be very careful before using either expression. One of the links in the description of this video shows the process of calculating the second moment of area for triangles and semicircles, if you want to check that out. 
Going back to my stress equation, we see that in general, sigma is equal to minus m times y over i, which is the general equation for the normal stress due to pure bending. If we now transition to the deflections, and recall that the strain is minus y over rho, where rho is the radius of curvature, we can use its mathematical definition to develop an expression that allows us to calculate the deflections. If you don't know where this mathematical expression for radius of curvature comes from, there's a link in the description below where the expression is derived from a mathematical standpoint, so make sure to check that one out. If we look at a beam that has been deformed by external couples, point loads, or distributed loads, we'd see that y prime, which is the slope of y, and therefore the slope of the beam, is usually very, very small. So if we take a very small value and square it, it's gonna be even smaller. 1 to the 3 over 2 is still 1, and therefore I can write this expression as minus y over epsilon equal to 1 over y double prime. We already knew that the elastic modulus times the strain is equal to the stress. So if I substitute the strain by sigma over elastic modulus and sigma by minus my over i from what we learned today, I find that y double prime is equal to m over ei. The moment is of course a function of x as it changes as I move along the axis of the beam. That's the whole reason we do bending moment diagrams. This means that y double prime is also a function of x. This expression is very important to calculate deflections, because if I know that I can find the second derivative, if I know the moment as a function of x, I can integrate once to find the slope of the beam and integrate a second time to find the deflection. In other words, if I find the moment as a function of x, I can integrate m over ei to find the slope at any point along the beam and the deflection at any point along the beam. Fortunately for us, we also know that the moment function is the integral of the shear forces function. And we even know that the shear forces function is the negative integral of the distributed load. So these expressions are what we use to find the deflections and the slopes of the beam and the sigma expression to calculate the stresses. If you remember from your Mechanics of Materials course, calculating the bending stresses came down to remembering that there is a negative sign in the equation, identifying the direction of the moment properly, remembering that y can be negative as well, but most importantly, it came down to calculating the second moment of area properly. To do that, you usually started calculating the centroid of your cross-section area, calculating the i for simpler geometries that make up that cross-section area, and in most cases, using the parallel axis theorem to account for the shapes that are not located on the centroid. When finding the second moment of area for composite materials, there was one extra step, which consisted in transforming one of the materials by making it wider or skinnier to account for the different elastic moduli. Just like for normal stresses due to axial loading, positive values of sigma translate into tensile stresses and negative values into compressive stresses. And that's why it's important to remember that conventions and always remember that the expression includes a negative sign. In the next video, we will start with a composite beam that is subjected to some bending loads and we will perform the whole process to find the location and magnitude of the maximum stress as well as the slopes and deflections using singularity functions. Thanks for watching.